Okay. I think it's still morning, but um, I just wanted to say before we uh, start off uh, an acknowledgement of the original lands that we are currently on. And those would be the lands of the Osage, the Kaw, the Kickapoo, and the Osheki Shakawin. And I'd also like to thank Susan Schaefer. I don't think she's in here right now, but she's the public service specialist with the library for asking me um, to speak. My name is Christina Valdivia Alcala, and my presentation, as you can see, is colonization, migration, and the longing for rootedness. Uh, this was specifically done when asked to speak by Susan, putting this together was specifically done for this identity quest uh, mm -hmm. presentation. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of gonna be moving, meandering, kind of like the serpent, right? My presentation is in no way, shape or form linear, but I hope that you can follow me as we go along and then afterwards have time for a question and answer if there are any. Um, Let's go here. Okay. I am a Chicana, born and raised on a farm near Grantville, and also grew up in Topeka's Oakland community. As I have deepened in my life, I understand with gratitude, with being raised on a small farm and having the beauty of nature all around the privilege of having glorious outdoor surroundings that created a comfort with hearing the sounds of non-city life and each year witnessing the visceral changes of the seasons, climbing trees, swimming in our pond, following the winding of creeks with my brothers as if we were explorers, in awe of the night stars in appearance and magnificent of the rising sun in the east. Yet too, growing up in Oakland's Mexican-American community kept me connected to stories there, legacies, and my community in ways I would not understand until I was older. My story, and by extension that of my family and historical ancestry, is one of complexity many missing pieces, migration, poverty, trauma, yet healing born of resiliency, the love of a colorful and fascinating culture, and the belief in family and importance of community. So let's just touch briefly on Mexican conquest and colonization. This slide. I didn't have artist credit on here, but before we get started, I just wanted you to know that uh, on this lower right hand side is the artwork of the one of the three great muralists of Mexico, Diego Rivera. It's entitled Exploitation by Spanish Conquistadors. Um, some of these other images I just took that were part of uh, codice, codices. Um, about the conquest of the Aztec Empire. As we, most of us probably know, the Aztec Empire was a conglomeration of many empires uh, that were defeated in uh, many, many battles over many, many centuries by the Aztecs, the Mexica. And in 1521, Hernan Cortes came to the New World and with his small armada was able to defeat uh, the indigenous people of Mexico. It was relatively quick and it was very brutal. So we want to just go over briefly the impact to indigenous people with Spain's colonization. And what we're talking about is the area um, of Mexico. Uh, we're not talking about the borders that we now know as the United States, which even though they are our relatives with having indigenous blood in us, uh, these numbers are taken from the Mexican conquest. 
So number one, the estimated population of indigenous pre-contact was 25 million. From 1521 to 1605, as many as 24 million indigenous of Mexico died due to disease, battle, poor nutrition, and brutal treatment by Spaniards. There was also the beginning of ongoing environmental degradation. Number three, a repression of the colonized. Number four, loss of religion and spiritual belief systems. Number five, loss of traditional lands. Number six, the indigenous were often enslaved. And seven, loss of traditional languages. And I'm sure, as you know, we could go on and, and say much more about this. So moving on back into the United States. The communities my mother and father's parents migrated from to the United States, the land we know as Mexico, were from the state of Guanajuato. My families left their homeland due to poverty, steep and grinding poverty, and because of hardships born of the 1910 Mexican Revolution. We are families of the railroad working in the beet fields in Nebraska or manufacturing plants in California. We are a mixture of European and indigenous. My paternal grandparents, Rito and Leonila Valdivia, came to the United States around 1926. My maternal grandmother, Maria Perez Valdivia, <coughs> was born in the United States. And my grandfather, Aristel Contreras Ramirez, went back and forth from the United States and Mexico, I believe starting in the early 1920s. On my father's side came a familia where the mindset, <coughs> the commitment and expectation was to volunteer. Whether that was helping Our Lady of Guadalupe School, the building of the school or Our Lady of Guadalupe Church. And just to stop here for a moment, as I got older and started doing more research on Our Lady of Guadalupe and conquest and what pre-colonial life was in Mexico, the overlay of Our Lady of Guadalupe underneath that as the Spanish Catholic Church was um, most oftentimes forcing the indigenous people to convert to the Catholic um, religion was there is an overlay if you do any in-depth research, the story of Our Lady Guadalupe, the story of Juan Diego, which is what we were raised on. Underneath that is the image of our, uh, not of Our Lady, but of Tonantzin. Tonantzin is the Nahuatl word for revered mother, born mother. So what you're actually seeing is to be able to get the indigenous populations that were connected to the land and to Mother Earth, to the stars, to the sky, to the moon, and practice their spirituality in that way. They did the overlay of Our Lady of Guadalupe to be able to convert more and more of the indigenous population. At any rate, I digress. So the commitment was to our Lady of Guadalupe School, our Lady of Guadalupe Church, helping with our annual fiesta. The mindset was one of collective effort and the life of the community driven by the church and school, yet most importantly, by the love and devotion to our Lady of Guadalupe. By the early 1950s, my grandpa Rito, with the help of his older children, was able to purchase close to 100 acres of land outside of Grantville. For a campesino from Mexico, land was everything. Eventually, my dad would purchase about 60 acres of this land, the home I grew up in. The land was sold in 1988. And to this day, my dad's decision to sell this familial land holds its own heartache that to this day 
my dad will shed tears over. So we wanna just quickly go over my family line. This right here are my uh, paternal, no, my maternal great grandparents. This is my mom and dad. This is my uh, great grandfather on my dad's side. This is uh, both sets of my grandparents. I was especially close to the Ramita's side. These are my dad's parents here that most of the indigenous blood that runs through my veins comes from my dad's side of the family. So maternal grandparents and great grandparents, Maria or Mary uh, Perez Ramirez, my grandmother, she was born here. She died in 2011. My grandpa, Aristel Contreras Ramirez, my grandfather born in Guanajuato, died in 1986. Then we go down to my great grandfather Ventura who died in 77. My great grandmother that I never knew died in 1920. Jesus Castro Perez, my great great grandmother deceased in uh, 1919, um, not sure where she died. And then we go on to great grandfather, great 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 grandfather. And then Daria Contreras Barajas, great grandmother born in Mexico, 1879. This would be her here, unknown date of death. My dad's side of the family is much less extensive because there are just no records that we have access to right now. My grandfather died in 1970. I never knew my grandmother. She died in 1958. And then we go down to my great grandfather and my great grandmother. My maternal grandparents lived in Oakland all during my life, and I was very close to them both. We often stayed overnight with them, and their home was a hub since we went to school down the street. My mom worked less than a block away at the Motive Tower building with Santa Fe. And my grandpa, Aristel, and my great grandpa, Ventura, worked in the Santa Fe shops less than 50 feet away from the shotgun house at 120 Northeast Chandler. Within these walls, with, with aunts, uncles, and cousins combined, everybody packed into this small house. I often heard lively discussions on both politics of the United States and Mexico, politics at the local level and larger state level. There were debates on religion and education. And yet always the deep undercurrent I felt from my grandpa in his struggle with staying in the United States and longing to be back in Mexico. These conversations took place at two small kitchen tables where we crammed over the mainstay of love my grandma had over her cooking. We became a highly assimilated community once settling in Kansas. By the second generation, the majority of Mexican Americans in Topeka had lost the Spanish language. We knew little of Mexican history or the history of the Mexican Americans across the United States. We were sometimes called mestizo, that being of Spanish heritage in Indio is what we used to say back in the 70s, it was Indio. It wasn't indigenous, it wasn't Native American, it was Indio. But what did Indio mean? Much later into my 30s, I wondered, what did it mean to be part Indio, indigenous? Was my familial legacy from the Huicho people, from the Purepecha, Zapotec, Nahuatl? While I know I have approximately 50% indigenous blood, the rest is shrouded in mystery. I will eventually go to Mexico with the hope of finding more answers. Yet I understand we are a people still looking to remember ourselves collectively. Next slide is going to be some of what I'm talking, the fusion of two races. So these are pieces of art uh, done. This piece of art here is by uh, the famous uh, U.S. Chicano muralist Judy Baca, 
called mestiza. Um, mestizo by Eduardo Diaz and Mestizo Art by Amado and Benya Jr. And you can kind of see here what we're looking at, kind of this combination and, and mixing. And you can see that here as well. And then I want to share too some of the slides of how I was raised. And these are all pictures from family photo albums. This is our farm that was out by Grantville. The image of Our Lady of Guadalupe. I don't know how many of you have been to the church of Our Lady of Guadalupe here in Topeka. If you haven't, you should. It has one of the most beautiful mosaics probably across the country. Um, I would say maybe even into Mexico as well. This was a hand done uh, mosaic by four to six Mexican men back in 1962 that is now in Our Lady of Guadalupe Church here in Topeka. This is the house I was raised in on 120 Northeast Chandler and this is my grandma. This is another picture of the land that I was raised in. And just the emphasis here, my grandpa and the closeness that I had, especially to these two grandparents. The commitment and respect of our elders. We were raised to respect our elders, um, to be watchful of them, to not talk back to them and to take care of them. And we still try to maintain that as much as possible. These are the rail uh, yards right next to the school, Our Lady Guadalupe, that I went to. Some of the many Mexican-American women that you grew uh, came from that legacy of volunteerism. Here's Our Lady Guadalupe Church in Oakland, a number of our Fiesta books. This is a really bad picture, but this is a picture of Our Lady Guadalupe School uh, that I went to. My mom worked right across the street at the Motive Power Building. And this is a picture of my dad helping with the fiesta stages. I'm sure some of you have been to the fiesta. <laughs> How my family maintained cultural traditions growing up. Primary was the feast day of Our Lady of Guadalupe on December 12th. That day was everything to us. It's hard to explain it now all of these years, but we were just geared towards that celebration. Getting up early in the morning, having mass with our community, chocolate, pan de huevo. It was everything. I mean, and that's one of the main things of our culture that was taught to us was the story of Juan Diego and Our Lady Guadalupe. And my brothers and I participated in dancing, uh, folkloric dancing, bailes mestizos. Uh, here's a picture of me dancing Veracruz, one of our programs, us being in the fiesta, a parade that used to be a really big thing in the 70s. And we continued celebrating Las Posadas, which is done around the time of Christmas. Also, uh, Fiesta Mexicana, which was founded in 1933 and is all volunteer. And continuing from childhood on, our food, music, and art remain integral. This is a piece of art we have in our home from the artist Joey Rocha that is here in Topeka. Music always, it's a mainstay. And our traditional foods of chiles, beans. This is my daughter and my granddaughter when we're making tamales, chiles. All of these, what ended up being indigenous foods, we have kept along in our, uh, in our menu as well. Yet, yeah. With the culture full of richness and depth, as I entered my early teen years, I became more troubled, at the same time curious. Why? This tension was created because of the isolation and disconnect I experienced when I moved beyond the realm of the community and into the larger Anglo community. Along with this, on both sides of my family growing up, I was quite the sensitive to the palpable wafting in the air of a familial, heavy, stoic silence, sadness, at times grief. Yet I moved through all of this realization, being able to feel these feelings that existed in the environment, but I kept quiet about it because to share it, to ask questions about it, 
would make others uncomfortable. I grew confused and isolated in wanting to understand why my grandmother would go down to the small basement of their home and weep so deeply we could hear her. It was like almost wails, right, of grief coming up through the heating vents. Why my dad raised my brothers to not cry and watch as their young faces contorted to hold their emotions in. I could not understand why my own mother refused to talk about her life going back and forth from Mexico to the United States until the age of 11 or 12. And why did my grandpa seem filled with continued longing and muffled sorrow when listening to Mexican music? And once I moved more and more into the realm outside the Mexican community, I could not shake the feeling of being different, not only with my skin color, but the difference in what we ate, the music that we listened to, the strong connections that we were raised to value of our families and our elders. I longed to hear stories as I got into my young teen years more and more from my grandpa, Aristel, on his recollections of the 1910 Mexican Revolution so as to gain understanding on why the homeland was left. In high school, I was overcome at times with anxiety and fear because of bullying. I took Spanish one and two, and I ached to be bilingual, yet I was ashamed of wanting to connect to a different language that had been denied me. I began to drink heavily while in high school, and my parents were at a loss on what to do with me. I had a rebellious nature, but it was more bent on self-destruction. I loved to write poetry and stories, yet believed I had no talent. One of them, and in our senior year of high school at Haiti, not one of the Mexican-American girls I went to school with, along with myself, were encouraged to go to college by the high school guidance counselor. The sense of fear, isolation, confusion, and silence entrapped me for decades to come. Within my own Mexican American community, I was now beginning to feel like an outsider. Now we wanna go next to identity. So here we have more artwork, some beautiful artwork. Um, Lizard Bride by Maya Gonzalez, Chicana by Angelica Contreras, this beautiful photograph by Dee Montoya, and Honoring Grandmothers by Isabel Martinez. This also is a picture of my little familia. I am married. I have one daughter and two precious grandchildren. And then this is writings, a picture of the writings that I had done at 13 years of age when I was deeply confused and just terrified of growing up and, and starting to straddle those two worlds of the worlds of my community and then the worlds of going outside of my community. So that's a photo of that. Since that time, and for decades, I've been on a quest for identity. I will admit, most of this was done unknowingly. The untangling of familial history, my own place within my family system, along with learning to move beyond my family of origin, has been rather like slowly unknotting strands of vivid and beautiful embroidery threads. Identity is in part behavioral and also one's physical traits. Our childhood and life experience shape identity and lay the foundation for our worldview and the way that we engage in relationships. So probably about, and I'm 60 now, so probably about seven years or so ago, I started reading on uh, generational uh, trauma. 
And while my heart hurt that I was able to see the faces of my family in the pages of examples of trauma, I also was greatly relieved to know myself and my family were not the only ones. So I'm gonna move over to these last two slides. This is transgenerational trauma, and this is taken from psychology today. Trans transgenerational trauma refers to a type of trauma that does not end with the individual. Instead, it lingers and gnaws through one generation to the next. Families with a history of unresolved trauma, depression, anxiety, and addiction may continue to pass maladaptive coping strategies and distrustful views of life onto future generations. In this way, one can repeat the same patterns and attitudes of former generations, regardless of whether they are healthy or not. Transgenerational trauma isn't something that can be easily pinpointed. It is often covert, undefined, and subtle, surfacing through family patterns and forms of hypervigilance, mistrust, anxiety, depression, issues with self-esteem, and other negative coping strategies. We also know that trauma can have a significant effect on the immune system and may contribute to the generational curse of autoimmune diseases and other chronic illnesses. So before I read just like a couple of paragraphs from an oral history I did on my maternal grandmother back in 1996, um, I'm gonna read that, but then we'll go into the trauma of colonialism and migration in our familial histories. And I mean that in both sides of my family. But first, focusing on this first statement, multiple early deaths due to illness and their lack of health care, both in the USA and Mexico, that happened within my family system. And I just wanna to touch base on, on this paragraph. Mary's early life was colored by multiple losses. Her grandmother died in 1919, followed by the death of her one-year-old brother due to a concussion after falling down the steps at their home. A few weeks later, in February 1920, Mary's mother died due to massive blood loss after miscarrying a third child. Ventura felt the miscarriage was due to the loss of their toddler's son. Once his wife was buried, he refused to talk to Mary at all about what had occurred. Mary feels part of the reason her mother died was because her father did not take his wife to the hospital right away. She notes men, Mexican men, were very possessive of their wives at that time and did not even like doctors to examine them. By the time her mother arrived at the hospital, she was near death due to excessive bleeding and ultimately would die. So we can also see a loss of Spanish language with second generation of US born. Both maternal and maternal families were steeped in grinding poverty in Mexico and little education for forcing the families to migrate. Talk about the Valdivia family currently having indigenous DNA from 50 to 72%, yet there is no history of tribal lineage, indigenous language spoken, nor knowledge of indigenous culture. On both parental and maternal lines, there is a history of depression, anxiety, and alcoholism. A few records, letters, photos to recall stories to give insight into Mexico before migration. No known records to learn more on our European heritage and those ancestral family lines. Loss of indigenous connection to the land, place and ancestral connections was diminished over the generation the inability and refusal in many areas of family history to talk about the past unless it is pleasant or sentimental. So in closing, I wanna talk about the longing for rootedness, which I believe a lot of my journey has been about and finding that rootedness and end with this um, beautiful quote. To me, Rootedness in my experience includes grounding, awareness of place and time one is living in, 
the capacity to feel and experience life and relationships, connection to the community I live in, my neighbors, us all watching out for one another, the physical, local meaning for me, that would be living by the river, working in a community <laughs> garden, learning how to grow plants from seeds. It's caused a deep desire for me to also become involved in causes of both environmental and social justice within my community, within my own community and outside my own community. I needed all of this grounding because without this, I would be wandering and I am done wandering. The wound of dislocation from my ancestral homeland remains, yet I know there is a time and a place for me to explore my heritage in Mexico. The reclaiming of some indigenous practices has been healing and grounding for me and continues. And in my journey for identity, home, and rootedness, I am grateful to my ancestors for their endurance, guidance, and love. And I would end with Sharon Blackie, a psychologist, a poet, an author, and a woman who is reconnected with her own Celtic traditions. And when we lose our relationship with the land and the other creatures around us, then in the deepest sense, we lose ourselves. If we no longer feel nurtured by the earth, we no longer belong to it. And because we do not belong to it, we do not feel responsible for it. So thank you for listening. <laughs> it was sold in, in about 1988. And my parents moved into town. My uncle Swan and his family still has their 30 some acres out there. Oh. But those were all the original lands my grandpa was able with the help from family to, to purchase. <laughs> yes. Uh, my question is two part. You mentioned that we are currently on the land that belongs to the Osage, the Shaw, the Kickapoo, and I didn't catch the fork. So from my research, what I can tell it is the Osage, the Kaw, Kickapoo, and the spelling of Osheti is O-C-E-T-I, first word, last word, Shakawin, S-A-K-O-W-I-N. And uh, second part, is the Kickapoo uh, Europeanized um, pronunciation of the indigenous word? I'm sure these are all, except the Osheti Shakalin. Right. I'm sure these are all their English names. Right. And I'm asking because my, uh, my great grandmother was Kickapoo. Yes. Yeah. And I don't know what those original yeah, names are. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Thank you. Oh, it's also one of Brazilians, but thank you so much for coming. Thank you guys. Thank you, Chinta, for coming.